So let me introduce who I'm with. Scott Evans, uh, one of our deacons. He uh, does logistics for Rarig, uh, a company here in, in Wintersville. Uh, Linda Spencer is a retired principal from Hancock County Schools, and uh, she's well-known in the community. Just leave it at that. Uh, Pete Brogdon, uh, one of our deacons also, works for uh, the city of Weirton, um, and his wife, Alicia Brogdon, who is an employee at Kroger and Company. So all of these uh, people are very active members here at Crossroads, and... Um, this is a difficult topic uh, based on what's going on in the world. And in case no one noticed, all of you are black. You come to Crossroads. So um, the reason that I, I gathered this group together is, is twofold. Um, you know, Crossroads is a church that has, uh, I was telling Linda, I counted 22 uh, black regular attendees. Um, that's 25 if you do preacher math. Um, so, and, and, but then we have several other minority families too. So that's, that's not a huge number by percentage, but it's enough that it, it, it's noticeable. Um, and I think the problem that we have is that uh, this issue isn't talked about. And I think it's not talked about for two reasons, both of which I'm hoping we can, we can put a dent in uh, with speaking out. The first is that I think there's people who are racist. And if that's true, I'm hoping that our conversation will convict them. I hope that um, my testimony and my involvement will be something that will be a conviction to them. Um, but the other thing I think is, is um, that people just don't know what to think or don't know what to say, or, or, and they just need information. And they need to see how brothers and sisters in Christ, um, what, you, what you guys are dealing with that they might not really understand, they might not have experienced, and really hear from your heart, from, from brothers and sisters in Christ that we trust um, and we know, um, and we feel like we have things in common with uh, kind of what your experience is. And so I think, um, you know, the way to start would be maybe for each of you um, just to, you know, whether it's in the church or in the world, just share a little bit about kind of how this issue of racism has affected you. Well, thank you. Um, well, and I've experienced personally racism several times in my life. Um, you know, growing up in suburban Pittsburgh, I grew up around a lot of white people. There weren't too many black people. Um, in my graduating class of high school, there was only three black people. So I grew up around a lot of white people, had a lot of white friends, always very comfortable around white people. And I didn't realize how bad racism was for a long time in my life. Um, but one time in high school, um, I was probably ninth or 10th grade at the time. Uh, one of the teachers uh, during a study hall session um, had an issue with another student, a friend of mine who was sitting next to me. And this is a, a, a white friend of mine. And uh, the teacher came up to him and was berating him pretty bad. And I, I remember just looking there like, wow, this is, this is bad. And I said that. I was like, I said, wow, out loud. And he turned to me and said, I don't need any of that N-word attitude in my class. Well, needless to say, that person was terminated um, once everyone found out. Uh, but I couldn't believe that. It was the first time that had happened to me face to face. I knew it was probably overt uh, at times, but to be like that direct was... Uh, astonishing. And then uh, later in life, uh, when I was in my early 20s, I had a situation with a uh, uh, girl I was dating at the time. Her dad, it was, uh, she was white, her, and her dad um, had nasty things to say about me. She, I, he came to my, straight to my face and said, I don't want you dating my girl, I mean my daughter, you're not good enough. I didn't think anything of it at first. And I asked him, I said, why am I not good enough? He's like, well, look at you. And I kind of said, all right, I get it, I understand. And then a time more recently, just five, maybe five years ago, I was at a dry cleaner, uh, wanted to get a suit dry cleaned. 
and the gentleman wouldn't wait on me. He just stared at me. And at first I thought maybe he's busy, maybe something's going. I tried to give everyone the benefit of the doubt, but I kind of had a hunch. Then many other customers walked in, many other customers, six or seven other customers, female, male, all white. They all got served. I never got served. And he said, what is it going to take for you to leave? Don't you get it? And I just said, you have a good day, sir. And See, we'll, that, oh. that's something that I, I couldn't relate to. I mean, I just, uh, realistically, you, you tell the story, and I'm, and I'm thinking how I would feel, but I, I, I've never, I mean, I've had people refuse me service because I've acted like an idiot, you know, but I mean, just, I, that, that's, it, and, and that was five years ago. I mean, that's since you've been in this church. Yes. Yep. And then we tell people, go out and witness and go out and, and you know, and, and then you go out and that happens. You know, did you invite him to church? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> No, I, so. but I was polite to him. I said, I did, I, you know, I was boiling mad inside. Absolutely. But I said, you have a good day, sir. You know, I didn't want to give him any ammunition to, yeah. you know. Linda, what? I was just going to say, if, if you would have. Mike. Oh, I'm sorry. You're, you're, I was just going to say that if you had seen when he was talking about not being waited on, you could look at all of our faces and see that we've also experienced that. Yeah. You know, more than one time. So it wasn't. It wasn't a surprise, but I guess when you're not accustomed to it, and uh, you think... I, I was actually thinking, I wish I'd have been there with you. We'd have, we'd have made a scene together. We'd have made a scene. So. Oh. Okay, well, um, I've had a lot of experiences, um, a lot of experiences. Uh, and when I first started in education, I started off as a teacher. And I came to Weirton, I wasn't from Weirton, but I came to Weirton as a teacher. And um, when I first applied for the job, as a teaching job, um, they said, the Board of Education told me that I would be hired, but they wanted me to work at uh, Cove Elementary School, which is the school where the blacks went. Well, there was a gentleman on the school board who didn't want me there. He wanted me to go to another elementary school, and he was a white gentleman. And he didn't, he, he thought that I shouldn't be, or every black teacher should not be in the black school. And they had a big, there was a big ordeal about it. I didn't know what was going on. I didn't, I was new to the area. So I just basically waited and went where they told me to go, which was the black school. That's where I ended up at. I didn't even, I didn't realize until later that there was a stigma to the black school because the students were, Students were excellent. I mean, we had, we had such a good school. And um, even as I watched the students leave that school and go on to high school, and I would look at the valedictorians, and they came from the school that, that I taught from, and I was really proud of that. But that was, just, that was just beginning, and I really didn't know what to expect. And so I taught for a while, and then I got my, um, I got, the first master's degree was in counseling, because I really wanted to be a counselor at the high school. And um, then I was told that once you're a counselor, you don't leave. You know, you just kind of die in that position. <laughs> um, but I went from teaching elementary school to teaching the middle school. And I was a teacher at the middle school, and they did have a counselor there. Well, the counselor, I heard that the counselor was leaving and going to the high school. So I went to the principal, and I said, that's the job I'd like to have. And he basically said, okay, you know, you, you can do that. Well, as... I didn't hear anything during the summer, and I called the principal, and he said, well, the counselor from the high school is just coming to the middle school, and we're just going to exchange so that we don't need you. So I said, okay, here we go. <laughs> so that was one experience at, at the middle school. And I also noticed from elementary all the way to middle school, the students were treated differently. It seemed that the teachers were afraid, especially of the black male students. I mean, we're talking kids. We're not talking... Um, they weren't even teenagers at the time. And we were in elementary school and the middle school, and I would constantly see the black guys out in the hall, or they would put them out of class, or they would send them to the principal's office for something that was just so minor that I saw every day that other students did, but they didn't get reprimanded and whatever. And I just noticed um, just how they were treated differently, and it, and it did, it bothered me. Um, I have a son. And so I made sure that I was there at every conference. At, uh, every time there was a meeting at the schools, I made sure that I was there. I was even asked, why are you here? 
you know, I'm here to make sure that my son is doing well and whatever, but they seem to think that I shouldn't be there. Uh, so there was a lot, and even as far as um, I went into, I didn't get a counseling job, so I went to administration. So I went and got my administrative uh, certificate, and um, I became a principal. First, they sent me to a little area that was outside of Weirton, um, where there were no minorities at all. And I was at the elementary school there, which I didn't, as an assistant principal, which I didn't mind at all, and worked very well with the community and with the students and, and whatever. And I, as a matter of fact, I liked being the assistant principal. And then the superintendent told me that he was going to move me to the middle school in that little town. And I was going to be the principal at the middle school. Well, I told him really that I didn't want to go, but he said I didn't have much of a choice, so that's where I was going. So I went to the middle school, which was really the year from hell for me. Most of the, empl most of the, got, most of the employees were male, so they, I was the administrator over white men, and they didn't like it. <laughs> and they weren't going to be cooperative at all. And so I had people resign from being the coaches and resign from being this and that. And um, it, was, it was not good. And so I went to the superintendent and I told him, I, I'm not going to be here another year. I said, I'll go back to the classroom. I'll do whatever is necessary, but I, I can't do that. And, and his words were, I understand. I'll have another job for you. <laughs> so, which he did. He had another job and I did take um, a principalship, you know, somewhere else. But... Um, it was, it was very, very interesting. But I noticed that um, the white men were very, very uncomfortable, and there was no way they would cooperate. And they let me know. Do you, you think it was primarily because of your color, or was it a combination of female and black? I, I think it was a combination. Mm -hmm. doesn't, doesn't make it any better. In fact, it might make it worse. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but... Yeah. So, uh, so it was... It, it was very interesting, but I know the Lord used it, you know, and, yeah. he, and, I, and I thank him for that. So that's basically some of, some of the things thank you. That, uh, thank you. that I've experienced. Pete? So where do I begin? I, I know. It's... That was my fear with this, is that, you know, we might run a little, a little long. Yeah. But... No, uh, you know, unlike Scott, he was a little older when he... Uh, experienced his first uh, involvement or well I know you can't and, and I also know you can't tell by looking but he's also a little younger than you he, um, you don't look your age he look and he looks astute <laughs> for his age yeah. um, I moved to the area through college I'm from Warren Ohio and I moved to Weirton but my experiences still carry through to today um, but they started when I was like eight or nine years old, you know, riding a bike with my brother, which my wife never known, and being run off the road and some white gentlemen hollering at me, the N-word, you know, and that's the first experience that I've had, and I was like eight or nine years old. And then it just, you know, it, uh, you get adjusted to it. Yeah, but that's not mean, as an eight-year-old, right. that changes how you think about the world. Yeah, yeah, you know, uh, but it's, uh, it's such a common thing that uh, for us up here on this panel, it's not something that you get upset about because you live it. And it's something that people of other color doesn't live and it's hard for them to understand. Uh, that's just the one there. I've had situations where I, uh, my wife knows where I had applied for a job at a certain company, and I scored the highest on the test. But prior to that, my father-in-law or my mother-in-law got me an opportunity to get an application. And I walk in the room when I was told prior to that they weren't taking applications until my mother-in-law ran into the gentleman that was in charge. And I get the application, I go into the room, and it's full of all-white males. I happened to take the exam, and my neighbor told me I scored the highest on it. And so you were you were denied an an, an application. You were lied to that yes. they weren't taking applications, and, and then, then found out why because you happened to get one. Right, and then uh, 
I scored the highest on the exam, and my neighbor tells me that, you know, you're going to get this job and find out that it was the boss's nephew that ends up getting the job and he didn't score the highest. That's one incidence. The other was where I currently work now. Uh, I, uh, my father-in-law had to approach the place where I work now, and the gentleman that had quit, I replaced. And I had to take an exam for that. Uh, and I've had some incidents with employees at work. Sure. Where, you know, I had a situation where uh, we had a pet a dog on the job site, and one of the guys that I worked with, that I've been there several years, and anytime I, t I try to, uh, I experience racism with name calling, I always test your definition of what you're saying. You know, define to me what you just said and what does it mean? Well, the gentleman, my friend, was getting very close to the dog and it was a very friendly dog. Well, the guy that was working along with us says, hey, so-and-so, what are you going to do? You're going to let him and lip you? And I said, and then he looked at me and he, he turned, he, he was flushed. And I says, hey, you know, what does that mean? <laughs> and he you has know, no idea. He couldn't explain it to me. I said, look, I'm not upset, but you seem to use it very fluently. Tell me what that means. And he couldn't because, you know, it was kind of a, it's a slip. Sometimes when the word slips, it's something you're practicing. Yeah, the, well, the overflow of the heart comes out the mouth, Jesus yeah. said. Right. And, uh, but that's, you know, I, I don't want to go too long sure. into the experiences, but Thank you. I experienced it at a young age. What, you know, I would like to, if we get the opportunity to talk about how we address our children. Excellent. Yeah. Alicia? Well, I guess I really didn't know racism existed because where I was going to school, we all looked alike, we all played alike, we all hung out. But then as I began to get older and go to the middle school, then you had things that were happening and you were made very much aware that uh, we, wa we walked to school. We didn't get a bus. And we had to walk from one side of town on Weir Avenue all the way over to where the old football stadium was at. But the, there were kids that lived a couple blocks over and they got a bus. So our parents got together and rented a PNW bus and that's how we got to school, okay? If they didn't in the winter, we had to walk or someone walk. had to take it. And I was very fortunate because my parents had cars. A lot of my friends, their parents didn't have cars. So my dad worked, my mom worked. So we had more than my friends did. In the summer, we really didn't have a PNW bus, so we ended up walking. Sure. And at the time, it was a GC Murphy's that was right on Main Street. And if we would go in, they would say 1B, 2B, 5Bs, and they would follow us around. So that's when we were really faced with racism because we always stayed together. Junior high is when it really happened. And then it started getting worse when you went to try out for basketball or volleyball or cheering. Uh, you could do whatever those girls could do, but do it even better. And you never made the team. So why in the world would we even go and try to try out? Sure. You know, and then upon getting a job, I got a job only because my cousin had quit and got a job in the weird and still. And they only, at the establishment I worked, they only kept one B downtown. That's it. They could hire 50 Caucasians, but they would never hire a black. They have one. So I went, I got the job. I was so happy. I came home, I told my parents, you know, I got a job, my first job. You know, I really got it. It was the job that was from hell. Um, you did everything that they didn't want to do. Um, they treated you nasty. I know my manager one time, he was going to fire me. I had a lady that went to the church. And I worked every Sunday. And at that time, we closed at 7 o'clock. 
every Sunday I worked, and we closed at 7 o'clock, and church was right over here. I had a lady went to church, and she came in, and she looked at me, and she was very nasty, and she spit on me, and I said uh. to her, didn't you just come from church? She said, yeah. I said, well, then you, you didn't learn that. You need to go back. <laughs> well, she called my manager. He came to me, and he told me I was there to do my job and shut my mouth, and he didn't care what anyone told me or said to me. I was to shut my mouth and do my job. Well, that did not rest very well with me no. at all. Nor so, should it. Huh? Nor should it. But the people that I work with, being the only black there, they saw nothing wrong with it. And here I was, a young girl. Yeah. You know, so you can't... Um, they only allow you to do what they want you to do. And any time, and I guess all of us can say that, any time you want to do something that's going to better yourself or better the next person that they hire, no, it can't happen that way. Well, and here's, here's why I think part of this conversation just starting is so important. That a lot of people, well, they try to sidestep racism issues by saying, well, that was 100 years ago. Well, guess what? Your story was five years ago, and and. I'm not going to tell anybody's ages, but I know you two are in your 50s, so you're not that old. That wasn't, you know, this wasn't five generations ago. And so that, that's a, you're welcome, Pete. So that, that's, a, that's a big deal. I mean, it, it, it's not, um, and even though that wasn't yesterday, five years ago, I mean, this is still going on. Oh, it's still going And, and um, it's important, I think, that, that, we, that, that people who are white understand that it's still going on, even if they're, they might, you know, obviously people look in the mirror and say, well, I don't, I wouldn't talk to you that way. I wouldn't spin on you. But, but the fact that somebody still would means that, that, that you know, um, if one person is discriminated against, we all suffer. Well, Jeff, can I say this? I have had someone spin on me within the last four years. And my comment to the lady is when she spit on me and then she made a, a comment that she was so glad that I was going to be sent back to Africa. And I said, Africa? Yeah. I've never been there. No. Are you going to oh, Africa? boy. You can't. And she said, what? I'd like I to said, go the first time. You, yeah, I said, I guess you and I are going to be on the same plane. Uh. I've never been to Africa. But I was a smart aleck, but I wasn't. Yeah. You know a, what I mean? So. But, but how else can you, I mean, when, you, when you're in a situation like that, if you don't react sarcastically, I mean, I'm going to get angry. I was going to say, I, I know some people who the conversation would have been different, you know, white, black, or any other color. They'd have gone over the counter and had their way with them. So, but then okay. there are, I was going to say, there are, so, there are other white, white people who would never do anything like that. Sure, absolutely. But also, there are those who would never do it, but they won't confront the ones who do. And that's the problem. And that's, and that's the, the problem that we, we need to discuss. I think so. another thing is you just don't know sometimes, like, People say that, like, well, I wouldn't do that, or I wouldn't do that, or this person wouldn't do that. But you don't expect, like in my case, to walk into a dry cleaner ever and be denied service. Amen. You know, right. you, you don't know who it's going to be. Well, I, I think one of the things that's important is that, you know, each person kind of has a chance to, to um, speak on their own. And so as we were talking, I was taking some, some notes, and I kind of want to ask you individual questions. So... Um, I want to begin with you, Scott, you know, as a deacon and probably the person who commented the most about theological issues as we were talking earlier, um, I, I kind of was hoping you would give us um, maybe kind of what God's been laying on your heart as the Christian perspective uh, about racism and how, how we deal with racism. Sure. Um, you know, I, when situations arise like we've seen our communities in in recent weeks, I turned to scripture. Uh, I've been burying myself in scripture in recent weeks, and I've done it over the years when issues come up. And uh, I've noticed how much Jesus didn't come out and t explicitly talk about race, but yet it was, he did do things that if you pay attention, address it. Uh, I spoke earlier about the uh, woman at the well. Uh, I think Jesus was setting a very clear message there that we are 
God's children first. Uh, and if we are God's children first, that means we are all brothers and sisters. Yeah, well, and when you read that scripture, the shock of the apostles, yes. um, whether it's because she's a woman or a Samaritan, I, I always think it's both. Yes. But, but the shock is, is yes. impressive. That and he and her that. shock also, because she says, but you're a Jew. Right. Yeah. And, and he doesn't even address that at first. He addresses it later on in that scripture. Um, but he's more concerned about the healing than anything else at that moment. Amen. He's, he's loving. If there's anything that I think that we get from Scripture, it's, it's the love. Um, I mentioned earlier that it's the, the baseline through which we are supposed to hold ourselves accountable. And uh, when, I, when I view racism, I view it as a heart issue. I view, I view it as an issue that just shows how much more loving we need to do. And, you know, God, let, let me back up. What, what I see people turning to as a solution all the time is something social, something political. And though th those things do have a place, it has to have the proper foundation, and the proper foundation is Christ. Amen. God created the church to lead the culture, but we tend to be more concerned about the White House where God is more concerned about the church house. Amen. And the church house has to lead. If the church house does not lead, there is no hope for racism to ever be addressed properly. Um, and so the, the church house has to lead. Um, do we engage in politics? Yes. But we have to do so with a, coming from a place of love and compassion first. Our politics have to be set aside and, and love for our brothers and sisters has to be priority. Um, that, that's the first thing. The second thing, uh, theologically speaking, is uh, we must remember that oneness is our purpose. You know, uh, I think we were speaking off camera that uh, we're all wearing the same uniform here. And, and we are, the common purpose that we have is Christ. And that has to be at the center point of all of our minds. It has to be a, both the, the cornerstone and the capstone of, by which we operate. Amen. And, and if we don't do that, again, we will fail. Uh, I strongly believe that the way forward is through the Great Commission. Uh, if, we have, or if we are united around one world view, see, this, this, is, this is where... I, you know, speaking of the Great Commission, this is where I think we've failed in many areas as the church. We, there's three verbs in the Great Commission. There's go, there's baptize them, and teach them all that I've commanded you. We stop at the baptism part. We get them to church, and we stop discipling them. We stop discipling people. We stop teaching them. We don't do a good enough job teaching them, and so their worldview never changes. They're going to heaven, but they're not making a difference in the well, world. Yeah, we, we teach them about the Bible, but discipling means teaching them how to live like yes. Christ, not just know what Christ said. Exactly. Amen. Amen. And, and that's what we need to do a better job of. And, and you, know, I, you, know, you had mentioned in the introduction to this question about, you know, I've, I've spoken a lot about theology. That's how God made me, I believe. I, it's my passion. But also, I strongly believe that that is the answer, that Christ is the answer, love is the answer, and, you know, the, the greatest civil rights leader of our time was a, was a pastor. Amen. And, you know, early, in, early, early in, this, in the, the anti-slavery movement, it was all Christians. It was Quakers. The, the, the white people that were that managing the Underground Railroad, they were, they were Christians. They were Quakers. They were, pe yes. you know, people of faith. Yes. And we have to understand that the, um, the early church in America was complicit in the slave trade, and it'll be up to the church to repent of that and lead to correct Amen. it. Amen. Uh, you know, if God is your problem, then only God is your answer. And God is our problem in this, because we have turned from God in this area. And, and unless we turn back to God and seek healing through Him, there's no hope to... 
They Amen. fix this. Yeah, Psalm 33 is a beautiful scripture about uh, the unity uh, among brothers and sisters in Christ. And it talks about that. It's got that beautiful metaphor of the, the uh, oil flowing down onto Aaron's beard and how, how calming that is. And the, the thing is, is that scripture says, when people are unified, that's when God works. And so it's a, a wonderful commentary on how unity and the, the justice that draws people together and puts people together gives God this, this platform to work. So it's a beautiful picture. Scott, thank you. Thank you very much. All right, Linda. Now, I, I, as we were talking and I was making notes, I thought of something I, I would like you to comment on. And, and it's something that I think is very common in our culture and that you and I have in common. Um, I know that your grandchildren um, are, are both black and white, as you described them. And, and I also, you know, my daughter's white, but my son-in-law is from Mexico. So I have a, a biracial granddaughter also who, by the way, is the coolest human being in the world right? But, uh, and I'm sure we all think that about our grandkids, but so kind of speak, if you could, speak to, uh, to that experience, uh, what that's like in, in, in our culture. Um, it's hard, it, it's kind of hard to address, I think, um, because there are so many people that don't have biracial relationships in their families or in their lives. Of course, it's more common now than it than it's ever been, sure. and I think it will continue to be even more common than that. But um, it's it's special, and they go through, you know, things that nobody else seems to, because they are both. They are my grandchildren are both white and black, and I would never ever have them dismiss the fact that their their mother is white, and their father is black, and so they're both right. of those things. Um, what people don't understand is that America right now and a lot of the communities don't look at them as being both white and black, but just black. Sure. And um, even my son has said before, and he's taught my grandson that you are black. My daughter-in-law gets really upset with that and says he's not just black, he's white and black. And then my son says, but when he's out in society, and he walks into a place, he's black. Yeah. And they're going to treat him as if he's black. And so we have to teach him that, you know, and what to expect. Of course, my daughter-in-law is upset about it, and that's not fair, and that's not right, and that's not nice, and it isn't. It's a heart thing. Sure. And that's why I appreciate you even having this conversation, because if we are Christian, and we love the Lord with all of our heart, and we're walking according to his word, then... And we have certain ideologies or ideologies and um, even from upbringing or certain feelings that we have toward another race, then there has to be that conviction there to say, that's just not right, you know, and it's something that the Lord has to deal with me uh, with. And not to be ashamed to come for prayer or to talk um, with someone who can understand that this is something that, has to, that the Lord has to heal. Because there are some people that have had bad experiences with people of other races, and they carry that on forever, sure. you know. Uh, and, that, and they are convicted, I believe, if they love Jesus and they're filled with his spirit. There's no way that you can't be convicted, Amen. you know. And so just to understand that. And then when you have um, biracial grandchildren, and that's your heart, they are your heart, and you know what it Amen. is, how it is. Um, and when they come home and they're hurt, then you hurt. And how do you explain the love of Jesus you know, to a child who doesn't understand why they're treated differently. And the worst would be, how do you explain the love of Jesus when they're hurt by somebody in the church? Amen. You know, who, so it's something that everybody has to begin now to um, just kind of watch and listen and be there and speak, speak up when something needs to be said. And, and it's and as prevalent as it is becoming in our culture, we have to be extra attuned, in tune to that as, as Christians and as leaders in the church that we make sure we encourage uh, kids, you know, who are, who are black and white. Yes. Um, and, and love on them and uh, be a part of, the, you know, them growing up with a positive image of people and of Jesus. Yes. Yeah, it's a good, it's a good uh, because conversation. God is a... a God loves um, to have things that are 
varied and color, colorful. You can see even in nature things. All, there, I mean, he, his creation is just awesome. You know, and you wouldn't say that um, a red rose is any less valuable than a yellow one or a white right. one. They're all beautiful, you know, and that's, he created us. Well, we the varied ones creation. are more beautiful. Yeah. yeah. You know, we are his creation. Yeah. The, the, <laughs> the varied ones are more beautiful. If I start talking about my granddaughter, we'll never get out of here. So, amen. Thank amen. you very much, Linda. All right. Uh, Pete, you and I uh, have had some conversations over the past few weeks and really, um, uh, since I've known you about some things that really have, have helped me grow in the area of understanding race, racism and race relations and really have convicted me. And, and so um, uh, some of those conversations have involved things that maybe are different for you as a black man than, than me as a white man, things I wouldn't even consider or, or think about. Um, and and uh, revolving around things like parenting and, and things like that. Well, first you have to start with, you know, uh, letting them know about Christ and God Amen. and what their value is to God and how he values them. And that's how me and my wife has raised our sons. But the very disappointing thing is um, how we have to prepare our kids for dealing with racism and where white males don't ever have to prepare their children for that. Amen. Or you're caught off guard when your child comes home and says, Dad, am I bad because I'm dirty? And the authorities didn't address that when kids are saying that to him. Well, I know he's not physically dirty. We, we were real good with his hygiene. <laughs> so he's talking about his skin. So, I mean, and it, it doesn't stop there. You know, you have to instill in him the love that God has for him and that we're all the same. He just put a little color in some that he did in others. But it was that indifference that we're struggling with, that God is saying, why is this so hard? I gave everybody two eyes, one nose, and one heart, and everybody's blood is red. Why are we struggling with just a difference in color? Amen. Uh, it, and it goes from there all the way up to where they're adults, and we still are concerned about the racism that your children's facing. Amen. As to, you know, recently when they became young men in college and uh, addressing that, look, it's better to survive than try to be a hero and not know about it. You know, when you get pulled over, Yes, sir. No, sir. Hands on the wheel. I want to see you come home that night. That's a conversation that a gentleman at this church and I were together. I told him, you don't really ever have to think, you don't even think about that conversation of having, having that with your child. Well, that's a constant. Yeah. And I think that every uh, African American in today's society, daughter or son, they have to have that talk with their child. And, it, and it's so convicting because we don't, as whites, we, we don't even, that stuff doesn't even cross our mind. We have conversations with our kids about things, but, but not about, you know, our conversations are don't do anything stupid. But, but your conversations are, don't, aren't related to anything they've done. It's just, re, it, it's related it's to the color the, of their skin. And our conversations are how, how God made them how people see them differently. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, and it, takes, it takes some of their self-esteem out of them when they're addressed with that at a young age. Like Scott was saying, he, had, he remembers his first issue with racism. You know, for the white male, it's something he probably doesn't ever even deal with. No. But for me, I was eight or nine years old. My son was... And, and, it, and it goes grade. the same right up the chart as, as a white teenager, as a parent, as a, you know, there's things that we don't, and that's why I think what we're doing here is so important because for people to hear that story and, and realize that, that even, if, even if racism isn't as bad as it used to be, the fact that there's any of it, it means that you still have to have that conversation with your son 
And, it, and it's a problem. As Christians in, in church, if we start to look at people like Christ looks at them, then we start to teach our kids about Christ and his, his thoughts of people of other races and the value of them. Because to him, like Scott said, we're all still children of God. Amen. And one way to probably solve this is I've always said, unless people get the love of Christ in their heart, this is not going to get solved. Amen. Right. And as a couple, and you have a young child, you know, children are sponges. You know, you can be in church and having your Sunday's best. But when you go home and you say something that's out of order, that child is soaking it, it up. up. Amen. And guess what he does when he gets to his buddy? Yep. He that's shares the same it. Age. He shares that's where it's taught. Amen. all the water that he soaked up with that sponge. And then that kid brings all of that back to his parents. Amen. So, you know, and unless we have the love of Christ in our heart, we have to start teaching them better about race. Sure. And don't make it taboo. Right. You know what I mean? God made us different for a reason. Celebrating. Like, like yeah. Linda so. said about the different colors. You know, you were, you were talking about flowers. What about the rainbow? Yeah. yeah. And how that blends in in all those colors. Um, and, and, and who... who who among them, we look at the sunset and the sunrise, and the more colors, the better. Yeah. So, now, I just, I want to, before we move on to Alicia, I want to be clear. Both the deacons said, the love of Christ is the solution. Yeah. Just, I'm just throwing that, I love my church. I'm just throwing that out there. A little shameless plug for, you know, if you don't have a church, come to Crossroads. So, but right. that, that's basically it. You know, Amen. it's, it's, uh, Thank you, it's a challenge that, you know, as black males with, uh, sons or daughters, it's you uh, be prepared to uh, face Amen. that challenge. Thank you. All right, last but certainly not least, Alicia, I have a question for you, and I want to tell you, um, it's probably the most difficult question that I'm going to ask anyone because um, I think it's really important to get at the heart of the matter uh, that we talk about what goes on here at Crossroads. And as a greeter and, and someone with your personality who you know, is, is going to see everybody and talk to everybody. Um, you probably have experienced racism um, right here in your own church. And I know that that's difficult and, you know, please no names, but, but um, share that with us. How, what, what have you experienced right here at Crossroads that has uh, hurt you? In terms of racism. Well, Jeff, can I tell you what side of the church they sit and how far? No, I no you I cannot. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, yes, I, <laughs> yes, I have experienced it, but you have to overlook it. And the way I've over overlooked it was the spew love on them. Every time I see them, I would run to the door and touch them and say, good morning, I'm so glad you're here. And I would laugh, and, just, and they would see me coming, and they couldn't move quick enough to get away from me. So Praise it just Lord. let them know that I'm not going anywhere. And so you need to adjust to me. In the beginning, it was kind of hard, because not being a greeter and walking in where someone might have opened the door, and Peter and I came up, and they didn't open the door for us. I thought, oh. And do we want to go to church here? And Peter was like, oh, yeah, we'll come. Give it another shot. Thanks, well, Pete. <laughs> a couple more things happened, and I said to Peter, I said, Peter, I said, I, you know, I don't know. I'm not feeling this. And he said, oh, Lise, he said, but just, just wait. Give it. Just give it a little bit. Give it a little bit. And we would go home, and I, he'd just be talking. I said, you know what, Pete, I, I'm not feeling it. I'm just not feeling it. And Jeff, you would get up and you would say things. And one Sunday, you had said something and I sent you a text and I said, thank you very much. And you said, it wasn't me. It was the Holy Spirit. It wasn't me. It wasn't me. Because what you said let me know then that this is where I needed to be. Amen. And I needed to be here for whatever reason God needed me to be here. And that was to spread love. Okay, I remember there was an artist, and he said, if this world was all blind, 
we could never see color. We would only see the heart just by feeling it. So I'm here because I feel the heart of Christ Amen. and it beats inside of me every Sunday that I come. So if you don't want to be bothered and you happen to see me, go out the door and go in the other door so you don't have to come to us. No, I, actually, I'm going to give the opposite advice. If you're struggling in this area, yep. you're the friend they need. You're the friend they need. I, and I appreciate, I appreciate the fact that it's something that you guys are willing to, to um, deal with head on because if, if, if someone isn't bold enough to, to speak out, um, it won't get fixed. And, and, you know, as segregated as Sunday morning is, someone has to cross that line in order for things to get better. And, and um, you know, I, I know we're not perfect. Um, it, my mentor told me once, the best thing about the church is it's made up of people. And the worst thing about the church is it's made up of people. And black church, white church, Chinese church, Korean church, you're going to have people issues. And one of those is racism. And if we're not purposeful about, you know, stopping it or speaking out against it, it's not going to change. And so I really, I appreciate your hearts and I appreciate your efforts uh, being here. Can I interject one Yes. Thing? This um, be the last thing. There was a person here and every Sunday I would speak to that person. Every Sunday, every Sunday, regardless if I was agreed or not, I waited until I saw them sit in their chair. And I would speak to that person. And one Sunday, this person looked at me and he said, you know, I come in here, and I've been coming to this church for a long time, and you are the only person that makes me feel welcome. If that didn't change my heart about the people that are here, nothing would have changed Amen. it. And he, the person has been coming here way before I ever started coming. That is sad. What is so different about him yeah. that you would walk past him Amen. and not even recognize him? Amen. I was also going to say, too, that um, when I first started coming here, I, I talked to your wife. I asked her if she would just meet me and talk with me, and mm -hmm. she did. And um, her advice was to get in small group. You get in small group and you get to know people. And I began to come to the Bible study, the ladies' Bible study, and um, maybe work with Upward behind the concession stand. And I got to actually know people, and they actually got to know me. Sure. And I think it made a world of difference because they don't just see me as, the one, as a black lady that comes and sits in the church. They know who I am. Yeah, and sometimes those dynamics, like what you talked about with that gentleman, they're not black or white or old or young. They're, they're, they're big and small. Right. You know, the church has gotten big enough that... People just assume, well, somebody knows him. I don't know him, but somebody knows him. And if a person, unfortunately, the church is large enough, and in, in bigger churches, we, we really have to kind of fight this. People could show up and leave, and if they don't want to talk to anybody or don't want to plug in, it's possible that, that they might not. And so it's something that, you know, one of the solutions to that very problem is, wow, team, you know, you, you, people like you, black and white, with that attitude, I'm going to go talk to people. We've now given them authority and a shirt and, and you know, a position that, to, to let them use their spiritual gift and go seek those people out. All right, I, I, want, to, I want to end with a question. Um, but I, before I, I, I do, I want to kind of give a little testimony as to why I'm asking this question. I know... From a personal perspective, I know what I believe. I, I, I know that racism, racism is wrong. Um, you know, I, I teach that. I have preached that. But I was really convicted a couple of weeks ago as I was looking at, at what's going on around our country and as I was preparing a sermon about um, reconciliation, loving our, our neighbors. And um, I was really convicted that I wasn't speaking out enough. You know, I... Um, obviously, I try to avoid politics because it doesn't seem to benefit anyone. But also, um, church politics can be difficult. And for the sake of laying low, 
I, I just, I, I wasn't speaking out, not on social media, a little bit from the pulpit, but, but not even enough there, I don't think, directly about racism. And, and I was really convicted, you know, this is a justice issue. And, and so, um, you know, Tony Evans, was, was, I, I saw a, th- uh, a discussion with Dr. Tony Evans, and he said, uh, Psalm 89, he quoted Psalm 89, and he says, uh, from God's throne flow righteousness and justice. And, and if, if this is a justice issue, pastors should be talking about it, and we shouldn't be afraid. And so I was really convicted. And so I think there's a lot of people who, uh, white people in your church or in other churches who believe the right thing but are afraid to speak out or just don't want to, you know, don't, don't want to speak out. For me, it was just fear or laziness or some combination of both, frankly. And, and so um, I, I want to hear from you guys what you think uh, your brothers and sisters in Christ, specifically your, your white brothers and sisters in Christ, can do to make a difference. Uh, well, I think um, God's lowest standard that he gives us to live by is one of love. Um, and love means many things. You know, you know, in 1 Corinthians, you see that love is patient and love is kind. You know, one of the things that bothered me greatly in the recent weeks was how quick people were to get their opinion out there on things. You know, I know you, you said you felt convicted about maybe not being vocal enough early enough, but I think it's better to be patient and think, you know, Scripture tells us to be slow to speak and quick to listen. And I, we need to listen. We need to be compassionate. Um, and we need to get past the fear that we have on these issues, on this issue of racism. Um, you know, I think we throw verses around about, like, do not be discouraged or do not be dismayed. Um, and we think of, you know, maybe health issues or some other issues that may be going on in our lives, but social issues also. Don't be discouraged. Don't be, you know, don't be in fear of these things. Address them. You know, I... Uh, God built the church, Jesus built his church to lead culture, to influence culture, not to be influenced by it. And I see a lot of that in, in the church in general. You know, the culture is influencing how we think about things instead of us influencing the culture. Amen. And, and I would like to see us, you know, you know, you hear, be the church. Well, to me, that means going out making disciples, and showing people the proper worldview to have. I think a lot of racism comes from an improper worldview. Amen. And if we have the right worldview, that's half the battle right there, maybe even more than half the battle. And so we need to be purposeful about impacting the culture. You know, the very first thing that Jesus says in the Great Commission is to go. We have to start going. And if we do that, um, and we reach people, and we show them the love of Christ, and we, and we teach them what he's commanded us, I, a lot of this is resolved. But the problem is we, we, we don't even love each other in the church. And, and, I, and I, what I mean by that is we come to church, we sit with the same people, we talk to the same people. We don't even love the people we go to church with. How are we supposed to, and most of them, you know, in a predominantly white church, look alike. How are we ever supposed to love people who don't look like, like us if we don't even love the people who do look like us? So, you know, I hear go, and I hear go out of your way, uh, or get out of your circle. It, it sounds like you're, you're saying that uh, the solution would be more aggressively seeking people who you don't know or who look different than you. Just like Jesus did with the, with, the, with the woman at the well. Amen. He put his Jewishness aside to meet someone where they're at, someone of a different race than him, someone who was different from him. He purposely put that aside to heal someone. Purposely yeah. put things aside in your life to heal other people. And, and she grew through it. I think yeah. in this case, we, the people who are making the effort, would grow through it. Good. Thank you. Linda? Well, I just think that, um, I mean, not even just go, but where you are. If you see something, you say something, and you have to address it. If it's in your heart, and a lot of times the Holy Spirit will, I mean, he'll let you know when something just doesn't sit right with you, not to be afraid to say, 
that wasn't quite right, or um, that, how, did, how did you think you made that person feel? Or um, just to address it, even as far as uh, children are concerned, you have, to, you have to talk to them. You have to talk to them about the things that are uncomfortable. You know, if you're, if you're white and you're uncomfortable around black people or Hispanic people or any minority, um, you have to address it and you have to do whatever is necessary. And the best way to do that is if you're black, get a white friend. If you're white, get a black friend. Amen. You know, get to know people and get to know their homes and get to know how they do things. And um, once you get to know them, I think things change a little bit. They no longer become your black friend. They become your friend Amen. or your black brother or your black sister. They become your brother or your sister. You know, and I think that's the only way we can address it. Even um, when you see things in the church, which you will, I'd gone to visit um, a white church, a white Methodist church, when I was looking for churches, just, and it was all white. And I went in, on Wednesday, and it was a small group, and that was fine. We talked, and, and it was good. Then I went on a Sunday morning, and it was crowded, but there were a few seats empty. So I just kind of got to where there was an empty seat, and people began to move, you know, like the, <laughs> before, like the one that was sitting next to me got up and left. And then before I knew it, another person got up and left. And then another person, no, we're talking to church. And another person got up and left. And I'm sitting here thinking, okay, I'm the only one on this pew because everybody's gotten up to leave, right? So, and I wasn't the only one. I mean, other people noticed it. And, at, and then it was time for communion, and you were to go up to get communion. Well, I wasn't going to go up to get, I mean, I wasn't getting out of that seat until I could get out of the door, you know? So I'm sitting there, and then an elderly lady came up, and she put her hand on my shoulder. And she said, you come with me, because you're going to take communion. I didn't want to disrespect her. I didn't want to go. But I went up with her. And afterward, she talked to me, and she said, you know, like, some people are just ignorant. And this is not how the Lord has them, you know? I mean, Amen. But... And she was older. Now, there are plenty of young families and, uh, and you know, middle-aged people there. Nobody addressed it, but the one lady did. And God bless her for doing so, that. So whether it's our home or our work or, or the church. Yes. You know, we don't, we don't have, I, somehow I knew the principal was going to come up with bloom where you're planted. Yes. Yeah. Bloom where so you're planted. More aggressively go, but, but don't neglect your, your, own, your yes. own surroundings either. Good. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I think that, you know, when people learn to relax when other cultures are around, black or white, and there's nothing wrong with describing a person by what you see. You know, God made us differently. So if, if somebody says to me, hey, uh, who's your pastor? I'm going to say, it's this white guy named Jeff. You should not be offended because that's what you are. Right. So if you say, hi, I have, I have two black deacons. One's name's Pete. Or Pete, and you say, I got a deacon, his name's Pete. They say, is he black or white? If it's another white person you're talking to, you say, he's a black guy. That should not, it's not offensive to me. That's, right. that's the way God made me. As far as, as in church, I think about, you know, have we missed the mark? You know, the north and south of the cross, the arms, the hands, nail, east to west. The horizontal is just as important as the vertical. Amen. But underneath, I say, have we missed the mark? Because are we focusing so much on the vertical when we come into church and we see people of color and we walk by and turn our head, but then we worship God? Then I also think when I say, have we missed the mark, is because he does say, what you have done to the least of these, you've done it unto me. And we are a part of it. All of us are a part of God's image. Amen. You know, and I think if, pe if, if people of color, you're of color. I mean, light they, color, but. Yeah. Right. But, <laughs> but white people don't, they don't think of themselves as color. They think of us as people of color. We're all of color. If they just learn to relax and listen, talk about it. If, you've, yeah. if you're uncomfortable about something, of all places, Church should be the Amen. Place should be able Amen. To talk to me. Yeah. Because I, the last place I'm going to get upset is in church, right? Yeah. So, and you should be comfortable about it and talk. Amen. And Amen. maybe you'll see the inside of me that's crying out to you for an understanding. 
I'm not, you know, one of the worst things we have going on for us that's not good is social media. You know, we've been stereotyped in so many ways yeah. Yeah. that, you know, when you get to church and if it's a predominantly white or predominantly black church, and believe me, it can happen at a black church. I mean, the last mm -hmm. church we went to had white members there, and I felt kind of bad because there were some of us that were not approaching her. You know what I mean? Sure. And, and you know, so she, you, you can imagine what she felt. And then we come here, and you have the reverse. And they're uncomfortable because they won't take the time to just, like you said, be kind. Yeah. And I think what you hit on different than Scott, though, is that there's, there's a fear there. And people need to overcome that fear and, and, and be willing to, to allow their brothers and sisters in Christ who, are, and I don't want to say on the other side, but who are going through things that they can't experience to help them learn empathy or help them be informed. Jeff, I had a situation with another gentleman at this church, and I don't want to bring names up, but he told me he had a grandson. And he went down the street, and there was one black family that had moved in the neighborhood. And his grandson went down the street and said to the young black kid, hey, you want to be my friend? And I said to the gentleman, I said, that's the innocence of God. Because Amen. racism, hatred is taught. We, didn't, we weren't born like this. No, absolutely. It was taught from parents that teach this. And so he said, he found out, his grandson found out, that the young black kid had a trampoline in his backyard. So he said to me, he says, what can I do to make that family feel comfortable? He said, can I invite him over for dinner? I said, no. Just go up and just introduce yourself and welcome them to the neighborhood. As a matter of fact, tell them, if you have any problems with any of these people around here, you come see me. <laughs> Amen. You know what I mean? And, and, and make them feel at home. So maybe next time, when you're having a Picasso, say, hey, look, you don't mind having your son and my son, my grandson. Go yeah, and have some food ignoring the differences doesn't help. And sticking your head in the sand doesn't help. But being open enough to, to tell someone I'm your ally, that's a big deal. That's a big, that's a big deal. Alicia? Jeff, I think for me, it would, be that, um, it would be that God said, let us make man in our own image. Amen. So when I look at you, I see God. When I look at Scott, I see God. Amen. I think you know me, and I think everybody here knows me. My husband calls me the butterfly. And he always tells me, he says, you don't see things. I don't. Because I see you as just being a person. Amen. But I feel that the way we can address it and help, right now you have a lot of interracial marriages mm -hmm. that are having children. And how do you address those children? Because we have people that have children and say, I don't want you to play with them and call them the N-word. That is something that's being taught. Yeah. So we have to look at the innocence. It was on um, the news about the two little boys that got their hair cut. One was black and one was white. And he said, and the little black boy ended up getting his hair cut all off like the little white boy did. And he said, can you see that we're brothers now? <laughs> so in God, Amen. there is no color. We are all brothers. And because we can't get over those barriers, we are still divided. And yet we still say, we love God whom we've yeah. never seen. And you see me, you see Linda, you see Pete, and you see Scott. And, it, and you it, turn your head and don't show up. The beautiful thing about that lesson is it doesn't just go for race. That's right. It goes for age, sex, haircut. denomination, haircut. <laughs> You know, I mean, pe people who are sick, people who, you know, if, if somebody has cancer, it's usually obvious because they have to shave their head and wear a scarf or whatever, and people avoid them because they don't want to deal with difficult things, mm -hmm. but, but they need love. So it's, it's a, you know, it's the, that, that lesson is so applicable to all things, but more so right now to race because of what our country is going through. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing that, you know, I'll finish with this idea I, I've seen. Um, people say black, you know, when people say black lives matter and people will say, um, well, all lives matter. 
And, and what I was sharing with Pete the other day, what he shared with me was, and I, I'm, a, I'm quoting Pete, just so you know, uh, and I loved it. I've used it like 10 times since you told this to me. Um, I think that's just people deflecting. They don't want to deal with it. And, and of course, all lives matter. That goes without saying. You better hope when your house is on fire, the, f- the fire truck doesn't pull up at the end of the street and say, I'll get to your house in a minute because all houses matter. I got to check this house before I come to yours. Right. You know, they go to the house that's on fire. And right now, racism has come to the, surf- the, the b- bubble to the surface, and it's a real problem. And there really is systemic racism in our country. Maybe not in some of the ways that people assume there is, but there definitely is. And so, um, Black lives are the ones that are in crisis and they're the ones we're focusing on at the moment. And so, um, you know, if you're one of those people that's putting up there, all lives matter, stop. Um, you know, it, it's just, it's, it's not an appropriate response to black lives matter. Um, uh, what you, what you, appropriate response would be, yes. Yes. <laughs> yes, they do. So, uh, I, I just, I want to thank you guys for um, being here and for um, being open and honest. I, I hope that it helps uh, some of your brothers and sisters in Christ. And, you know, I, I, I honest, when I opened, I said, I, I want people to have information, but I want people to be convicted too. And, and um, you know, uh, thank you for being willing to, to help be a part of the solution. So if you would, I'd like to pray us out of here and uh, then we'll be done. Lord, I thank you for my brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, I thank you for their leadership, Lord, uh, not only here in the church with a couple of deacons and uh, but Lord, in, in their homes, in the community, uh, I know that each person here uh, are the kind of people that I've witnessed love and serve and uh, be involved in other people's lives. And Lord, I just praise you for their faith and their friendship. And Father, their openness and honesty t- today as we try to uh, just bring awareness, Lord, um, and help people grow through what has become, um, come, be, come to the forefront in our country, but Lord, has been going on as long as time, and Lord, it's wrong, uh, injustice in any form is bad, but racism in particular. So Lord, help us to be a part of the solution, and uh, we'll just praise you, Lord. We know it'll draw people to you because justice and righteousness always flow from your throne. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.